Certainly, I uh, there are always issues to thrash out national issues, and we'll do a bit here and then head back to the Sunrise Daily Studio. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Business Morning on Sunrise Daily. I'm Ini John Mekwa. We do about 30 minutes of business, beginning from the global oil space where it's recovered in Asian trade on Tuesday on heightened Middle East tensions, but gains were capped by weak demand. Uh, I'll take a look at the number right there. It's been moving red, very red, or green. Well, for this morning it's not so green 0.16 percent uh, in the green is what we have for brand 76 dollars 60 cents a bit of uh gain compared to what we had yesterday. WTI is $73.37 after going up 0.3% and of course that conflict uh, in the Middle East is a major one. Now Hamas has named it Gaza leader Yahya Sinwa as successor to the assassinated former chief Ismail Haniyeh on Tuesday, a move that reinforces the radical path pursued since that October 7 attack on Israel. And also, global oil inventories decreased by around 400,000 barrels per day in the first half of this year. And that's looking at a summary. And this is according to Energy Information Administration of the United States. The estimate was published and it expects that stockpiles will decline by around 800,000 barrels per day in the second half, which we are already running at this time. We look at the Naira, we know that, uh, yes, that new auction uh, system begins today. CBN auctioning uh, the dollars in the market. But as at yesterday's close, we saw again, I wonder if it's on the news of that new auction system that begins today. Uh, you know, news moves the market one way or the other. So we saw the Naira gained yesterday on NAFEM. It gained 0.38% to close at 1,601 Naira, open at 1,607 Naira. 15 Cobo, very close right there to what we have in NAFEX. We're talking about closing the gap right there in this two official markets. So uh, on NAFEX, it closed at 1,601.25 Cobo after it went up uh, much more, 0.72%. We'll see what will happen. Uh, a lot of positive vibes. Uh, and expectations from this new auction uh, style that the, that the CBN has introduced. Uh, but it begins today. We'll see what the Naira will close with today. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Now, talking about uh, the Naira and the Central Bank. Now, the federal government of Nigeria has launched Series I domestic USD bond, and it hopes to raise at least $500 million from local and international investors. According to the circular, the bond program has a total size of $2 billion, which can be upsized depending on the issuer's discretion. Of course, at this point, is the federal government. The bond has a five year tenure, offering a medium term investment opportunity for investors is looking for stable returns. It also states that the bonds coupon rate is benchmarked to be comparable federal government euro bonds yields, ensuring competitive returns that align with international market standards. An interest payment will be made semi-annually, providing regular income streams to investors and enhancing the bond's appeal. The bond offers a bullet repayment at maturity in dollars, ensuring full repayment of the principal amount at the end of the five-year term. So the bond is open to Nigerians and non-Nigerians residents in the country and in diaspora, as well as qualified institutional investors. It also qualifies as an investment option for pension funds, broadening its investor base and ensuring widespread Participation investors can subscribe with a minimum amount of $10,000 with additional investment in multiples of $1,000 thereafter. So if you do qualify and you've got the power, uh, you may look the way of the federal government's euro bond. And uh, it's always a safe investment, but five years, um, as they have noted. Now, let's talk about this and all the macroeconomic uh, happenings in Nigeria. They say with Dr. Josh Bamfo. Dr. Josh Bamfo is the partner and the head of the Transurprising Services Practice at Anderson, Nigeria. Uh, perhaps you can tell us some of the expectations at this time. Dr. Bamfo, good morning and thank you for your time. Good morning, Ine. Thanks for having me. So, uh, so, Dr. Bamfo, at this time now, we've seen uh, dust beginning to settle on the protests 
at least in most parts of the country. Thankful for that, uh, even though um, unexpectedly or um, unfortunately, I meant to say, we've seen some damages. But, you know, it comes back to the issue of... Um, fuel subsidy removal, we've seen the Naira trying to find a balance with the new Dutch auction system now reintroduced by the central bank. But you know, Nigerians are in a haste and asking, when can we begin to see the benefits of these reforms? We've, we had applause from IMF from the World Bank for those reforms. Um, when, can, when do you think, as an expert, in, in, as an economist, when can we begin? When would be a logical time to expect benefit from these reforms? All right. Thank you very much, Ine. I think um, just to backtrack a little bit, the major reason why for these protests is because cost of living has become unbearable for the average Nigerian. Uh, and how do you measure cost of living? You look at inflation rate as one of the major measures of um, cost of living. Inflation rate has been on the very high side in recent times. Uh, prior to the current um, Tinubu government taking over, you know, inflation rate was already on the high side. As of June 2023, inflation rate was around 22.8%. Um, that was um, just when the current government took over. So the two major reforms that they implemented, unfortunately, had the unintended adverse impact on inflation rate. So one was the removal of war subsidies, which meant that the price of um, fuel at the pumps, you know, was going to go up clearly. And the second was the quest of the CBN to try to bridge the variance between the official market rate of the exchange rate versus the power market rate um, by moving from a fixed exchange rate regime to a more floating exchange rate regime where you allow market forces to determine, you know, the price of Forex, which is the exchange rate. Um, yes, we've been able to achieve one of those goals, which is bridge the gap between the two rates, power market and official rate. However, it's, it has come at a huge cost, which is high volatility of the exchange rate. Now, exchange rate has then, you know, um, depreciated significantly. The official rate used to be a dollar to 460 as of May 2023. Um, today, it stands as a dollar to a, at around 1,600. That is a, over 300 percent increase you know, within a spirit of a year. That also adds to the cost of living because imported products get impacted, you know, when you have your exchange rate depreciate significantly against the hard currencies. Now, in the quest of the Central Bank of Nigeria to then deal with the high inflation rate, which has moved from, you know, about 22.8% to today, which is around 34.2%, all right, they've had to increase monetary policy rate, which is the interest rate at which the central bank sells um, you know, funds to other commercial and um, to commercial banks uh, from 18.5% as of June 2023 and today stands around 26.75, which means the cost of borrowing has also gone up. So if you look at the three markets, the market for goods and services, inflation determines that clearly cost of um, you know, um, living has gone up. You look at the market for funds, cost of borrowing has gone up. You look at the market for Forex, you know, exchange rate has gone up. So by and large, cost of living has gone up significantly. Question is, how do we actually alleviate uh, part of this? And remember, at the same time, wages and salaries have not gone up as much, which means that the standard of living of the average Nigerian has gone down. In fact, the economy has not grown as at a fast rate. The last data we have, which is quarter one of 2024, GDP growth rate was at 2.98, pretty close to the population growth rate, which means that if you look at it from a per capita point of view, we are pretty stagnant in terms of growth. So really, um, these are challenging times. Now, in terms of solution, clearly the CBN has done a pretty good job in trying to you know, um, do the best they have under their control to curb inflation. Um, but the focus has been on increases in monetary policy rate. What has been my view is that there should be increased focus in terms of stabilizing the exchange rate because the exchange rate has the potential of affecting other key areas of the economy, including inflation itself. So, for example, um, fuel subsidy has led to um, fuel prices going up. However, 
this problem has been actually worsened by the fact that our exchange rate has weakened and we need to import significant portions of these um, petroleum products. And with the weakening of the Naira against dollar, that makes the price of you know, fuel products at the pump you know, even more expensive. So you have two major forces working here. Removal of fuel subsidy, that makes the prices of fuel at the pump go up. And the weakening of the Naira, that also makes the, um, the price go, um, go up. So you can see the two forces working in tandem. Once again, if you look at other imports, you know, once you have a weakening Naira, that is going to make it expensive. So from my perspective, if we are really going to curb this inflation rate, you know, in a relatively short term, the focus cannot be predominantly on just increasing monetary policy rate. There should be increased focus on also ensuring that the exchange rate doesn't further weaken. And that's the reason why I've been of the view that for, uh, moving away from a fixed exchange rate to the other extreme, which is floating exchange rate regime, where there isn't much um, you know, guidance in terms of where the CBN wants the um, exchange rate to be, for me, will not really solve the, um, the inflation rate problem in the short term. However, there should be a middle ground. There should be some management of the floating exchange rate regime. I believe that if the CBN was committed to ensuring that the exchange rate um, hovers within a reasonable bound, such, such as 1,000 to 1,200 Naira to a dollar, and that's everything possible, including intervening on a consistent basis to maintain it within that band. It will be able to take out significantly the speculative activities of speculators who anticipate that the Naira is going to you know, depreciate over time and then demand so much within the short term with the intention of gaining when the Naira further depreciates. So, the, so Dr. Balfour, so Dr. Yeah. Balfour the, the thing is, um, removal of fuel subsidy, but even as we speak, we do know from you know, numbers and perspectives and calculation that subsidy is still being paid. Then on the other yeah. hand, floating of the exchange rate, we've seen many interventions from the central bank. So, I mean, it's actually managed, so it's not really like we're still looking at the real value of the Naira. So the question is, was it really worth it? And what are the benefits or what benefits can Nigerians expect, you know, after going through this hardship? So clearly, when you do an auction, right, the whole idea is that it's going to be based on demand and supply. However, when you determine that I'm going to um, make sure that I manage the exchange rate within a band, not fixed, right? There's a difference between fixing it to a specific price, which was the previous um, governor's position where we fixed the Naira to, you know, um, the Naira to the dollar at a particular um, rate, you know, such as 460, and it stays at that particular rate for a significant period of time. But if you can manage it within a band, what it does is, it manages the expectations of investors as well as speculators in the market. Today, yes, there's some intervention. Yes, um, the Central Bank of Nigeria sells dollars to the banks as well as some BDCs. However, there's no um, communication in terms of where they expect the price to be. And that is the biggest difference. You know, we all know how the central banks across the world impact you know, the expectations of investors. We saw that even in the U.S., when the, um, the Fed delayed in cutting down interest rates, and we saw how on Monday, you know, stock prices behaved, all right? So all these investors make decisions based on their expectations. They speculate. Now, the Central Bank of Nigeria can manage those expectations or those speculations and can be able to deal with some of the speculative activities in the market. Until they do that, what is going to happen is, yes, you're intervening. Yes, you are supplying as much as possible but you are still subject to the demand and supply forces. And there's a big chunk of demand which is being driven by speculators that you cannot actually manage. And that is what is leading to the Naira further depreciating. And as long as the Naira continues to depreciate, it's going to be very difficult for us to bring price stability, um, achieve price stability by the CBN. In other words, bring inflation rates down. Yes, um, Central Bank of Nigeria is doing a good job in terms of increasing monetary policy rate, you know, but it comes at a huge cost to the economy itself. You know, when the cost of borrowing keeps going up, investors cannot borrow as much, you know, in order to expand their businesses or even start new businesses. And that doesn't create a lot of job opportunities. 
that worsens the standard of living of the average Nigerian, coupled with the high cost of living, that creates misery within the economy, and that leads to such um, protests. So I think it's very important that CBN considers tweaking its policy to now focus a little bit more on exchange rate as opposed to their in the, um, significant focus on um, monetary policy rate in order to achieve price stability. All right, sir, Dr. Josh Bamfo, thank you for that suggestion. Uh, we do hope that they listen and perhaps maybe play around with it and see if it works. Dr. Josh Bamfo is partner and head of the Transfer Pricing Services Practice at Anderson, Nigeria. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you very much, Ine. Let's take a break when we come back. I will also continue, well, somewhat on that line, credit to private sector, those loans. How are they doing? How are small businesses dealing at this time? We'll talk about that after the break. Just stay with us. Welcome back. Now, Nigeria's credit to the private sector recorded a decline of approximately 9.65 trillion naira. That's from February to March this year. And this is directly linked to that uh, uh, hawkish stance of the Central Bank of Nigeria. That's 700 basis points hike on the NPR so far. The credit and monetary statistics data from the CBN indicates a 12% month-on-month decrease in credit allocation to the private sector. And this figure shows uh, that it went from 80.86 trillion naira in February to 71.21 in March. What does this mean? What exactly or who is feeling the pinch of this? Let's speak to the co-founder of Vendor Credits. Co-founder of Vendor Credits, uh, Mr. Lushe Sheton, joins us virtually from Lagos. Uh, Mr. Sheto, thank you for your time. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, pleasure speaking to you. Great. So, so tell us exactly how or where this is pinching. Um, I mean, the, the last uh, guest, I wonder if you listened, I was talking about the CBN. Obviously, we've seen they've been aggressive about dealing with inflation through the hike of NPR. Um, you deal with the credit and the small businesses. How and where exactly has this been pinching so far? Well, it pinches everywhere. Um, the last speaker spoke extensively about, um, you know, what has led us to where it is that we are. Um, and he has also emphasized on the fact that, you know, these challenges are deeply felt um, by businesses. If it, was, if it was easy doing business before, now it's tough. Um, I mean, corporate borrowings from the banks, as you have ruled out, has reduced um, significantly from the 80 trillion that it was in um, February of this year, down to about 74 trillion. Um, even corporate bond issuances have dropped significantly as well. Um, I think, as of the last figures that we had, I mean, they did of just about a billion in the whole of um, H1 of 2024. And we've seen that decrease of core and even commercial paper insurances as well, down to about 503 billion um, for the whole of H1 of 2024, uh, compared to 800, 800, over 800 trillion for the um, 800 billion for the last for the same period of 2023. Um, I mean, so you can imagine the impact of that on all the costs that corporates are having to deal with. On the supply side, we've seen a jump up in transportation costs, obviously, um, off the back of the removal of the full subsidy. We've seen um, production grow, costs go up as well because of you know the import dependence of some of the raw materials that we use to um, manufacture in the space as well. Um, on the demand side, we've also seen challenges because purchasing power has increased for the consumers, and off the back of that, what they're able to purchase from you, you know, has decreased. So you might see revenues go up, obviously because of adjustments in price. But when you're talking about quantity consumed, you see a decline in that. And you see companies having to start looking at innovative ways, um, you know, to be able to manage their costs because that cost they're incurring has to go somewhere. The buyers can't, the consumers can't take that cost fully. Um, so the customer company has to incur some of that cost and then pass it on with the vendors in which they do business with, and also find innovative ways in which they can um, somewhat reduce their cost of production without necessarily impacting on the quality of the products in which they're um, pushing out. So these are really, really tough times um, for companies in, in the private sector in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, so it does sound like, uh, even as I, I think you hinted, is uh, businesses have found innovative ways to survive because even the PMI for July uh, did show that purchasing cost is increasing, but in, but purchasing is still also increasing. So perhaps uh, there are some strategies that have, or innovations that have been adopted that is helping businesses to survive. Yeah, well, I mean, so a lot of girls are starting to look for alternatives. Um, if you have imported items, you need to start looking for local substitutes in which you can use to replace that. Um, people are having to look at, um, you know, complementary products in which they can use to sell the items that they are selling. You need to just drive overall sales volumes. Um, there's a lot of credit that is going out to distributors, which are the guys that are buying um, the items, such that um, at the end of the day, um, the products are able to get into the hands of the people that need it. So it's 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 a lot of innovation. Partnerships have, have become very critical as well. Um, traditional guys that typically wouldn't look at um, fintechs, for instance, to do business with them, are already that door has been opened uh, because you know they are more nimble and they are slimmer and able to also um, be at the forefront of innovation. So we see those collaborations occurring just to ensure that at the end of the day businesses are able to weather the storm that exists. Um, and we've seen the impact of not choosing to go that route as well. Um, we've seen over the this year alone, we've seen multinationals exit the country. We've seen um, Kimberly Clark, just to mention a few, GSK, even Microsoft, right? The tech innovation giants have had to pull out of the country as well. But I mean, what that does ultimately for everyone is that it also creates opportunities for local um, participate for players and entrepreneurs to come into those spaces and try and fill the voids that um, have been created by the exit of those um, multinationals. Um, so those are the, some of the things in which we're seeing happening in the space that are, you know, trying to address the challenges, enable businesses to come up, overcome, or find um, reasonable ways in which they can work around um, the challenges that the hash economic environments in Nigeria currently presents. But what's this doing to the supply chain landscape in Nigeria? Which way is it going? How is it changing? Oh, it's, um, it's tough. If it was tough before, it's much more tougher right now. I mean, um, energy is a major driver of cost, right? When you're trying to do logistics and supply chains are also heavily dependent on logistics, whether you're bringing the items into your warehouse for production, or you're taking it out to um, the distributors for final distribution to the consumers. So you've seen, you know, those costs go up as well. I mean, FX, for instance, has its own impact as well, because all the spare parts that um, your logistics guys use, they have to um, import those items. And with FX, you're know, almost doubling from what it was, um, even at the parallel market to the official rate, it just makes it a lot more difficult. Um, we've also seen a lot of companies. In the past, companies had maybe payment terms between their vendors of, say, 30 days, but they've had to go innovative and say, you know what, you have to increase this tenor. So instead of 30 days, we're seeing tenors being increased to 60 to 90 days. And, you know, margins are still trying to be held as tight as possible just to ensure that, you know, the companies can survive. So it's it's really... I mean, and we can see the final impact as well in the final price of the goods that are being consumed. Um, we've seen all beverages, all even flour and all the items that um, people consume, right, bear the, um, reflect the increased cost in the supply chain. So that's where the situation currently is regarding that. Do, do we have more incidents of bad debts? Um, missed timelines for debt servicing. Do, do you have a record of something like that? No, could, could, you come that could you come again on that, please? I mean, all of this, has it resulted in maybe more bad debts or timelines being missed when it comes to debt servicing as the oh, NPR yeah. increases? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, when you increase interest rates, um, it's a confirmed and proven fact that when you increase interest rates, typically um, your defaults increase as well, asset quality reduces. Um, and that's because, you know, um, that cost um, has to find some way in which it could be borne. Um, and, you know, by virtue of what's going on in the economy, where there's a general, um, what's the word, what's, when there's a general um, inflation situation and, you know, general economic hardship, 
and people be, have to sell for them to be able to generate cash flows to be able to repay on their obligations. So defaults are obviously going to go up um, um, in line with um, what we've seen happen on the um, um, you know, pricing on the interest rates. So defaults are definitely going to go up. So everybody now needs to start thinking around um, sectors in which identifying sectors where opportunities lie, right, that are somewhat resilient um, to the overall impact of what's going on in the economy, or not as impacted as many others would be. Um, and that's where you want to concentrate your credit as it is right now. Mm. Um, and in terms of timing, mean, like you rightly said, would that be well, the fintech? Have to start would, that, would that be the fintech? <laughs> Pardon? Would that be the fintech? They're supposed to bring solution at times like this. Oh, yes. Um, the fintechs are currently at the forefront of innovation um, because obviously um, we are trying to penetrate into the market. Um, so a lot of the traditional ways in which lending used to occur have to be reviewed. Um, you need to look at um, creating new parameters, right? In addition to some of the ones that you already have, um, to source on data from the clients that you want to lend to. And then off the back of that, you know, involve artificial intelligence as well as um, proprietary algorithms that exist right. um, that develop in-house to be able to, you know, determine um, what the new credit analysis structure should look like and what the new credit scores for customers should look like. All so right. fintechs are still, you know, at the front of that. All so right. Goes on. All right, thank you so much. A lot of work for the fintechs, an opportunity also for them to shine. You know, there's always an opportunity. Uh, I mean, making lemonade out of lime. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Olushe Isheto, co-founder of Vendor Credit, for your time and your thoughts. Thank you very much, Amy. All right, so um, uh, just a little bit of the markets now before we head back. Uh, yesterday was another red day dropping further uh, for the all share index. 96,000 now is what we have 96,928.5 to after it lost 0.67%. Equities cap uh, also dropped. That's 371 billion naira shaved off the market uh, right there, even though there was a positive for banking, consumer goods. Uh, but I mean, I think that it was the industrial goods that really brought down the market yesterday because it was down 3.69 percent we'll give you details and uh, intraday numbers at 1 p.m laddie williams will be here with anity edder let's head back to the sunrise daily studios <laughs>